Hello everybody, this is Dr. Walt Jernigan and welcome to the topic Sensation and Perception. In this lecture, I'm going to discuss the difference between sensation and perception. We'll move on to absolute and difference thresholds. Then we'll spend a big portion of our time on sensation in the five major senses and most of that time on the eyes and the ears. Finally, we get to principles of perception including organization and constancy. And then for fun, right at the end, we address the issue of subliminal perception. Is it real? Well, let's get started. We define sensation as the process by which the senses pick up visual, auditory, and other sensory stimuli. These sensory stimuli are then transmitted to the brain. This is done by the process of transduction. Think about this. Everything you can see and hear, taste, touch, and smell, is converted by the sensory receptors, your eyes, ears, tongue, skin and nostrils, into the neural impulse. The neural impulse is the electrochemical language of the brain. The impulse is then transmitted to the appropriate lobe of the brain. This is sensation. Perception, on the other hand, is the process by which the brain actively organizes and interprets sensory stimuli. Remember, sensation begins with external energy. It's taken in by the sense receptors. The sensory neuron takes it up to the brain. Then perception takes over. Here's an analogy I hope will help. Think of emails coming into your inbox overnight. That is equivalent to sensation. Next morning, you begin organizing and prioritizing these emails. Some emails you're going to delete immediately. Some you'll respond to in a few days, and then others you will answer immediately. This is analogous to the process of perception, where the brain actively organizes and interprets sensory stimuli. You're doing the same thing with your emails. Let's move on to absolute and difference thresholds. See the figure in your chapter on absolute thresholds. This is the minimum amount of sensory stimulation that can be detected 50% of the time. The figure has some good examples with vision and hearing. For vision, a candle flame 30 miles away on a clear night. For hearing, a watch ticking 20 feet away. It's not important that we memorize these, but it is interesting to go over some of these. Then we have the difference threshold. This is defined as the smallest change in a stimulus required to produce a difference in noticeable sensation. Historically, this was referred to as the just noticeable difference, or JND. Weber's law is very important here. Weber's law states that the JND for all senses does not depend on a fixed amount of change in stimulus. Weber's law states that the JND depends on a proportion or a percentage of change in a stimulus. It's important to remember that it's not the amount but the percent of change. For example, lifting free weights, the percent of change rule is 2%. If you're working out on the bench press with 100 pounds and somebody changes the amount you're working with that you're not aware of, you would notice 98 pounds or 102 pounds because the change is 2%. But you would not notice 99 or 101 pounds. That is less than a 2% change. Sensory adaptation occurs when sensory receptors grow accustomed to constant unchanging levels of stimuli over time. It allows us to shift our attention to what is most important in any key moment. Here's an example I hope will illustrate. I was born and raised in Central Florida and during my college days I worked at Walt Disney World. It was a great place to work. I had friends all over the park. Sometimes I would go visit the It's a Small World After All attraction. And you recognize that song sung by the children's chorus. But after a while it gets to be a little annoying. And I would ask my friends there, how do you stand that? 
listening to that all day. And they told me, I know what you mean. They explained that you noticed it for the first 20 minutes in a shift, but after that, it kind of recedes into the background as a low rumble. You really don't even notice it. That is a perfect example of sensory adaptation. The brain is freed up to focus and shift attention on what's most important at any moment after that. Well, that's a good review of some basic principles of sensation. Now let's focus on the traditional senses and beginning with vision. Vision seems to be our primary sense as human beings. Consequently, we've studied vision more than any other human sense. Take a look at the figure on the eye in your book. I'm going to go over some of the structures, but as psychologists, we are most interested in the retina, the rods, and the cones. First off is the cornea. It's a tough, transparent, protective layer covering the front of the eye. It performs the first step in vision by bending the light rays inward. It directs the light rays through the pupil. The pupil. This is a small, dark opening in the center of the iris. The iris is the colored part of the eye. It dilates and contracts the pupil to regulate the amount of light entering the eye. The lens is suspended right behind the iris and the pupil. It's composed of many thin layers and looks like a transparent disc. The lens performs the task of focusing on viewed objects and changes shape as it does so. The lens flattens as it focuses on objects at a distance. On the other hand, the lens becomes more spherical, bulging in the center as it focuses on close objects. This flattening and bulging action of the lens is known as accommodation. Now, let's get to the stuff that's most interesting to us as psychologists, the retina. The retina is a layer of tissue on the inner surface of the eyeball. It contains the sensory receptors for vision. Think of the retina as the film in your camera. There's two types of receptors, rods and cones. The rods are named because they do resemble the rods, and cones resemble an ice cream cone. You have 120 million rods in each retina. They are extremely light sensitive and they're best for viewing in dim lighting situations. You have 6 million cones in each retina and these enable us to see color and fine detail. Have you ever entered a darkened movie theater where you're momentarily blinded? There are chemicals in the rods in the retina of your eyes. In dim lighting, they combine to form a more complex chemical that allows us to see with just a little light. Dark adaptation takes about 15 to 20 minutes. And then when you exit the theater, you become momentarily blinded again. The complex chemical must break apart into the basic components so that we regain normal color vision. This process of building up the chemical to allow us to see in a dim situation is called dark adaptation. The fovea is a small area the size of a period at the center of the retina. It provides the clearest and the sharpest vision because it has the largest concentration of cones. When you look directly at an object in good lighting, you're trying to focus light on the fovea. The eye and the brain do that automatically. The optic nerve in each eye is a small cable of tissue that exits out the back of the eye and sends neural impulses up to the occipital lobe in the brain. The location where the optic nerve exits out the back of the eye is called the blind spot. Look at the figure in the chapter to see where your blind spot is. Another important thing to us as psychologists is the discovery of feature detectors that are located in the occipital lobe. These are neurons in the lobe that respond only to one specific feature. Some feature detectors we've discovered include those for lines, 
angles, right angle, lines of a specific length, vertical versus horizontal, and on and on. The occipital lobe works with millions of pieces of visual information. It works with other parts of the brain in order to combine and assemble into whole visual images. And I think what's most amazing is that it does all of this in a fraction of a second, many times a second. Let's move on to color vision. There are three aspects to color, but hue is by far and away the most important. Saturation and brightness also play secondary roles. When you say an object has a certain color, what we're really referring to is hue. Hue provides the basic color, but can detect thousands of subtle color shadings. Saturation and brightness help us to do that. How do we see color? Well, there's two major theories have been offered. The trichromatic theory and the more complex opponent process theory. The trichromatic theory states that at the retina level we have three types of specialized cones. These cones each give a maximum chemical response to blue, green, or red. The opponent process theory, on the other hand, states that at a higher level on the way to the brain, we have three types of cells. These respond by increasing or decreasing the rate of firing when different colors are present. The three types of cells are red-green, yellow-blue, and white-black. The red-green cells increase their firing when red is present, but decrease when green is present. The yellow-blue cells increase their firing when yellow is present, but decrease when blue is present. And the white-black cells, they increase their firing when white is present, but decrease in the absence of light. Check out the Try It a Negative After Image. Stare at the white dot on the flag in the wrong colors for a minute. Then shift your gaze to the dot in the black rectangle. You'll see the American flag in its true colors. This phenomenon is called a negative after image. It demonstrates the opponent process theory. The cell responding to the first color tires, so the opponent cell begins to fire. Now, which one of these theories of color vision are right? It turns out they both have a piece of the truth. In summary, it seems that color coding starts in the cones in the retina and supports the trichromatic theory. But color coding finishes in the occipital lobe and that supports the opponent process theory. Let's turn our attention to hearing. Sound has three major characteristics. Pitch, volume, and timbre. We're most interested in pitch. Pitch is determined by frequency measured in hertz, which ranges from 20 to 20,000. The ear has three major divisions. The outer ear captures and funnels airways to the eardrum, which conducts it to the middle ear. In fact, if you lost your outer ear, you could still hear. The middle ear contains the three smallest bones in the body and magnifies the waves up to 22 times. The middle ear sends the message to the inner ear which contains the cochlea. The cochlea is where transduction truly takes place. The cochlea's importance is analogous to the retina in the eye. The cochlea looks like a snail and is filled with fluid. Vibrations set off waves which push hair cells back and forth. If the tip of the hair bundle moves, a message is sent to the temporal lobe. Now, just as color vision has two primary theories, there are two theories of hearing for pitch, the place theory and frequency theory. Place theory states that pitch is determined by where in the cochlea the hair cells vibrate the most. Frequency theory, on the other hand, states that hair cells vibrate the same number of times per second 
as the waves that reach them. Place theory seems to hold true for pitches that are greater than a thousand hertz. Frequency theory seems to hold true for pitches that are less than 500 hertz. And the evidence is that both place theory and frequency theory work when the pitch is between 500 and 1000 hertz.